Aloha and welcome to Books, 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 where we discuss reading, writing, and everything in between and beyond. I'm your host, Dr. Rita Forsyth, coming to you from Maui on the Think, Think Tech Network series, broadcasting from our studio in downtown Honolulu. The title of today's episode is When to Speak Up and When to Shut Up. Joining me today is my good friend, Dr. Michael Sedler. Dr. Sedler is a behavior consultant who has written the popular book, When to Speak Up and When to Shut Up, with over 400,000 copies sold. His other book, now titled What to Do When Words Get Ugly, is a reprint of his popular books, Stopping Words That Hurt and Stop the Runaway Conversation. His books are faith-based and inspires people towards love, compassion, and relationships with others. Today, Dr. Sedler joins us from Idaho, but he calls Spokane, Washington home. He travels the United States and Canada, providing consultation services and seminars for schools, agencies, and businesses, and has worked for the Heritage Institute for over 30 years. Welcome, Michael. Hello, Rita. Good to be with you. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, uh, how did pleasure. you get started writing these books? Well, uh, inspiration. Uh, I actually was uh, in a place where I actually heard somebody talk a little bit about the topic of gossip and the dangers of listening to gossip, et cetera. And it so resonated with me as I looked at my own life and realized how often I said things about people and I spoke about people and said negative things and passed along words of uh, inaccuracy that uh, I just got so inspired about it. I started writing and taking notes and it eventually evolved into a, a manuscript that I sent in and was published. Excellent. And you call your books crossover books. What do you mean by that? Well, they're intended, they are faith-based books uh, for your readers to know that uh, I do mention the Bible. I have biblical scriptures. Uh, I give stories out of the Bible as part of some of the uh, foundation, but I also talk about a lot of general topics and ideas, my backgrounds in counseling. I have a master's in uh, social work. And so I bring a lot of that into my books. So the crossover books, meaning that even if you aren't faith-based in your perspective in life, you can still glean lots of information from the books and be able to apply it to your life without feeling like you're being bombarded by a lot of religious rhetoric. So true, because I've read both your books and I was able to uh, see the difference between the faith, faith-based parts and then how that leads into the parts in our everyday lives. So let's talk a little bit about when to speak up and when to shut up. I really enjoyed this book because it addresses the issues of um, kind of discriminating between speaking up and silence. So my question is, when is silence golden and when is it better to speak up? As I say in the book, it, it, we've all fallen into this trap of walking away from a conversation and saying, oh, I should have said something and walking away from a conversation going, oh, why did I say anything? Yeah. And that's what we're looking at. And so the idea of silence is golden is that there are times that really our silence speaks much louder than the words we could ever speak. And I'm just going to use a word right now for your listeners, and that is the word timing. That timing has everything to do with when we say things and when we shouldn't. It's so funny that you say that because that was my father's favorite thing to say to me. Okay. He would say, Rita, timing is everything because obviously... Obviously, I wasn't <laughs> being appropriate with my timing. Can you give us some examples about that? Uh, yes. Uh, the, the idea that there are times where we're talking with friends or with people and there's something that a topic or something that comes up that we may feel passionate about, we may feel strong about. And we need to decide, do I want to interject my thoughts right now in the conversation, which very likely is going to turn the conversation towards me and perhaps create dissension in our discussion, or is right now not the right time, and maybe I need to speak to someone privately. A, an example being I had something happen not long ago where I was with a group of friends, and somebody said some things that I thought were a little a bias and prejudice, but I didn't bring it up in the group because I felt it wasn't the right place, but I did pull that friend aside later and said to them, you may not have intended it this way, but this is how I interpreted it. I just want to let you know that. And we had a very, very positive discussion about it, which I don't think would have taken place if I would have brought it up in the group. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. 
So uh, when we were talking before, because um, we've visited each other quite a bit, um, I think you brought up something about Gorbachev and his recent passing. Yeah, I, I interestingly, my wife and I some years ago had a chance to travel to Russia. We spent quite a bit of time there and heard quite a bit from the Russian people. And there was a, a bit of disagreement about Gorbachev because of what happened during the 80s when he separated Russia uh, and USSR into all these different pl places that they are now, uh, the different uh, countries. And so here a man has died. And even now, uh, I know that there are some of the leaders in Russia are not speaking kindly of Gorbachev because of what transpired. And we know that we see that even in our, in our own country, unfortunately, how often in politics, all we hear are the negatives and the lambasting of one another and nothing about the issues. Yeah, yeah stick with the issues. So uh, another thing that you and I have talked about is purpose purpose in life. And I think that kind of comes up in this book. Yeah, see, the, the intent as I, as I write uh, really both the books, but specifically this book, which I would say is a very practical book. It's written from a very counseling perspective of helping us sort of know the ABCs and the one, two, threes of connecting with people. And the purpose behind our speaking or what I call our motives are, is very important. And so I often say, even in the book, but I say in my life, I have a little, you and you and I were talking earlier in the week, I showed you a little plaque I had on my desk, and it says, what is my motive? Or what is my purpose? In other words, why am I saying this? Is this to further me? Is it to gain my own adoration? Is it for people to recognize me in my own thinking patterns? Or is it to help educate people? Is it to help bring out another perspective? Is it brought up so we simply take a moment to think? It's very important that we evaluate what our purpose is in our sharing. Yeah, very true. So would you spend a little time reading from when to speak up and when to shut up? I'd, I'd love to. And I'm going to share a, a, a section that I find is hardly ever talked about, but is one that really is so important in this whole topic. So we're gonna talk about the idea of questioning or asking questions of the authority in our life. Okay, so I'm gonna read, read from that. We're gonna explore a very difficult topic, one that creates confusion in families, in businesses, in local churches, and the world at large. It involves relating to another person who's in authority in your life. It is one thing to challenge a friend, a coworker, a peer, or when confrontation involves your supervisor, a parent, a teacher, or even a religious leader, we oftentimes have second thoughts about speaking up. After all, this person has the authority to fire us or ground us, if it's your parents, take away privileges, or even to stifle our personal growth. Who wants to upset that person? So instead of dealing in a godly manner with our misgivings, we fall into the trap of misguided silence, which often leads to gossip, resentment, murmuring, or anger. This presents its own unique and difficult problems. So in order to avoid the many pitfalls of failing to speak up when we should, let's examine the difference between questioning and asking questions. Questioning will be viewed as an attack and a negative interaction to the authority, whereas asking questions will be perceived as curiosity or desire to gain more knowledge or understanding. So first of all, what is questioning? Well, let's remember that not all forms of questioning are in the form of a question. It could be a statement even. When our motive is to create disunity or to override another person's opinion with our own, to prove a point or to simply create confusion or dissension, this would fall in the category of questioning. Questioning is confrontational. It's a form with, that's filled with suspicion, a lack of trust, and an accusation that puts the other person on the defensive. One type of questioning I call persisting. Once an answer is given by the person, the questioner asks another question because they didn't get the answer they wanted, so they keep persisting and pushing towards the person. In fact, one of our sons had the habit of asking a question and then persisting if he didn't get the right answer. He would respond with comments like, and see if these don't sound familiar, you don't understand, or you aren't listening, or let me say it another way. One effective approach my wife and I found is to front load our answer. 
Before we'd answer him, we'd say, now, are you ready for the answer that we're going to give you? And what if it isn't the one that you expect? Will you be okay with it, even if it isn't in agreement with you? And we gave him a moment to think through this. And oftentimes he'd say, yeah, I'm ready. And then we would share and we'd be able to talk to him. And even if it didn't work, the ground rules at least have been established. Challenging is another form of questioning. We have our own agenda and plan to attack the other person's approach and decision. We come prepared to list areas of disagreement and we're really not interested in listening to the person. We have our own plan and know what we want to hear. So what is your, mo your motive in questioning another person? Now, on the other hand, we have the approach of asking questions. The situation may be identical to the one that we just approached in a questioning format, but the difference is our attitude and our desire to truly hear and answer. The Bible's filled with illustrations of both questioning and asking questions. Some people, like the Pharisees, approach Jesus to attempt to trap him in his words or to ridicule in front of others. While there are others, like the disciples, who wanted to hear information so they could grow and mature in their life. I firmly believe it is okay to ask questions of our leaders and authorities. But how do I approach them? And what is truly my attitude or motive? Do I want them to admit they're wrong? Or am I desiring to be educated in their point of view? Am I okay if they don't see it the way I do? Or do I need to convince them that I am correct? I like to ask questions. And I like to hear other viewpoints to become more educated and to clear up confusion, to share another perspective. And yes, help another person see another viewpoint. But if my motive is to become self-serving and focus on my rights and my point of view, this becomes challenging for the person in authority and will often turn out poorly. Now, if I can read, I'd like to just share a quick story that I think illustrates this. That'd be great. When I, when I was working in the schools, I worked in a middle school. And I, uh, at one point, uh, our assistant principal let me know that one of the students that I had in class, Daryl, was going to be suspended for a week because of something he did in another class. Now, Daryl was a young man that I knew who was difficult, challenging. I had him the year before, but he was actually doing pretty well in my class and doing well in a couple other classes because you know we talked amongst each other as teachers. So I went to our assistant principal and my words were very close to this. I said to her, Julie, you're the assistant principal and you are in charge and you're the authority. And I wanna let you know, I will support whatever you decide. But can I take a moment and give you another perspective about Daryl? At which point she said, yes. And I went on to share about how well Daryl was doing in my class and even maybe some other classes. And I asked if there wasn't some way that instead of him being suspended for the whole week and missing classes that he was doing well in, wasn't there a way that we could discipline him and him still being a part of the things he was successful in and maybe missing or having uh, in-house suspension from the classes that he was struggling in? Well, I'm going to let you know that she listened, but Julie came back and said, Mike, I feel at this point he needs to be suspended. And I walked away and I felt fine because I felt like I was able to share what I believed. She listened, took it into account, had a bigger picture than I did as my authority, but I felt like I could go to her. And I wanna say this, over the years that I had Julie as my administrator, there were numerous times I went to her about different things. And I would say more often than not, she listened to what I had to say. She put it within the bank of her learning and she changed her mind on many topics because of more information from another perspective I was able to give her. So that would be the difference between me going and asking questions and presenting something versus me going and challenging her authority. Well, as a former administrator myself in schools, I loved working with teachers like you because I don't mind uh, people asking me questions or pushing back on some of the decisions because we're all learners. Right. Um, okay, so your next book, I found your book, What to Do When Things Get Ugly, really interesting because I want to learn more about the danger of gossip. Um, so... Why did you decide again to write about gossip? I know you were inspired, but let's talk about gossip. And, uh, you know, I don't know when you started writing this book, but man, with social media and things today, you know, gossip is really different today than it was 20, 30 years ago. 
I actually started writing this around that time that you just mentioned. Uh, it was probably in the, early, in the early 90s. And I, as I mentioned, I heard some teaching on this topic, but I happened to be going from where I, where I was working at. We were going through some things in our workplace. And I, again, Rita, I, I remember as a principal, you and I worked together. I know my wife worked with you. And so I'm very familiar with the things in the school settings. I love the setting I was Yeah, the setting I was in, there was lots of things going on, a lot of gossip about frustration with teachers, administration, superintendent, and all sorts of things. And when I heard this teaching, I realized how I'd gotten sucked in to the topics that were being discussed. And even though I didn't know some of the information, I took what other people were saying as, I'll use the word as gospel, as truth, and it began to permeate within me. And I began to look at things differently than I used to because I had misinformation things that I didn't even know about. And so it really resonated with me enough to where I started, like I said, started writing. And I want to let you know that this topic I have talked about all around the world. I've been to Japan. I've been to Brazil. I've been to Aruba. Uh, I've been all around the United States, Canada, Mexico, sharing this topic because it is a topic. There isn't one person listening right now that either hasn't had something said negative about them or hasn't said something negative about another person. I just had my first episode of online bullying happen to me. I never thought in my age that would happen. And yeah. I was just shocked. And, you know, it really made me realize what our teenagers and our young people are going through today with the online bullying and, and the rampant gossip. Yes, yes it's uh, and I, I do, like as you mentioned in your intro, I do a lot of training. Uh, I work in schools all around the United States and uh, Canada and other areas and do a lot of trainings. And that's one of the topics that we talk about a lot uh, is especially at that middle school or, or uh, intermediate grades ages where kids are starting to move more into the media and social media. And we talk a lot about cyberbullying and the dangers of those types of things and what we can do. I just got a, an email from a, a, a principal in, in Montana who wants me to come and do things with their secondary grades because there's a lot of cyberbullying going on that's affecting the school. Yeah, it's really difficult for those kids, and they've got enough to deal with. Yeah. So one thing that you were talking about the other day was how gossip that we hear is even more dangerous to us and to our psyche than the gossip that we say. Can you talk a little bit about that? This, this is something that uh, I, I sort of understood differently after I began writing and realized so often we're worried about the words we say, which please, we should. We should be very careful about that. But I realized how by even listening to things, I'd be in situations, I wouldn't say anything, but by hearing it. I remember being around in, in the schools, and you'll recognize this, Rita, and, and hearing about a parent or a student and listening to other educators talk about them. I did not have them in class. I didn't know them, but I listened and listened and listened. And then if that student ended up being in my classroom, I had a preconceived notion before I ever worked with that student or that family because of things that I heard. And that's why it's so important sitting around the kitchen table and talking about frustrations with our boss or frustration with our, our children's teachers or frustration in our community with our neighbors, it will impact your children as they listen to what you have to say and they will walk away with a tainted perspective, one that's not from their own knowledge base, but one is from your perspective and usually your perspective is a frustration. And maybe in a week or two, you have a different view. You work through it and everything's healthy, but not with the one that listened to it. I had a laugh out loud when I was reading your book because you give little tips on how to deal with people who are gossiping around you. And one of them was uh, you say, oh, I'm going to go check on that with the person you're talking about. And I thought, oh, that'll shut them up. <laughs> exactly. I mean, imagine, just imagine for your listeners, imagine right now thinking of someone telling you about somebody that you both know, a friend or whatever, and something that they said or did, and you're, th and you're thinking inside, which happens all the time. Gosh, I, that just doesn't sound like them. Well, imagine you turning to that person saying, you know what? That sounds really harsh. That's hard. But I'll tell you, you know, I'm going to go and check with Tommy a, a little bit and see what he has to say about that, because that really doesn't sound like him. It'll be interesting how that person backtracks pretty quickly. Oh, I love that one. So why do we gossip? Well, there's a number of reasons I think we gossip, but uh, the, the primary ones that I see, number one, sometimes we get hurt and we get wounded by someone. And because we're wounded or hurt, 
we will end up saying something negative about them and share uh, from our perspective, our own wounds and hurts. Uh, sometimes we do it and I see it, we see it all the time in the media and I'm not picking on politicians, but it's very prevalent with our politicians that they will say things negative about a candidate because they're wanting to build themselves up. They're wanting people to respond to them and they want to get their votes. So they, they put, you know, the old saying, you put down another person to build your own self up. Yeah. So I think those are two primary reasons that we find for people gossiping. But a third actually is sometimes people just like to hear themselves talk. Yeah. <laughs> that is true. Say, so would you read a little bit from what to do when words get ugly? I'd be glad to. I'd be glad to. And and I want to just say, if, if anybody wants to find more information about myself or my books and you want to see some more, I have a website uh, that's just my name. It's on the screen. You can see that. And feel free to go to that and check out a little bit more about what the books and other areas are about. I've heard many teachings and presentations on the dangers of gossip, slander, and murmuring. Why I would like to suggest that my desire, like most people in life, was to bridle my tongue for many years, I was totally unsuccessful in that area. Time and time again, I find myself speaking negative of others and being involved in critical conversations. This was very frustrating and also confusing. The world tells us that it's okay to speak negatively about one another. Newspapers, television, magazines, and the media in general make millions of dollars exploiting individuals by sharing their misfortunes. Talk shows, never tire of exposing people in order to create a scandalous atmosphere. And I'll add to our pleasure. Reality shows are based upon embarrassing people and revealing negative areas of life. And don't get me started on politics where the issues are no longer discussed and instead character assassination of all other candidates is condoned. Emails, texts, Snapchat, Twitter, Facebook, chat rooms, and other social media outlets allow for fast delivery of information, regardless of the consequences of the words. We are so brainwashed into believing that it's permissible to violate another person verbally, that it takes a concentrated effort for us to have a new thought pattern. Our words, I believe, create injury and pain in life, yet we seem oblivious to the results. So in my book, I talk a lot about not just what you say, but what to do when others want to engage you in negative conversation. Now, my goal is to bring compassion and love to others in a way that will assist them in developing positive speech patterns. The topic of gossip is not one that people can ever take lightly. It's an issue for everyone, especially uh, of personal faith and conviction. Unless action is taken early on, gossip and murmuring will increase progressively in speed and potential damage. Like a powerhouse locomotive, the negative report will take us down well-worn tracks of personal defilement and towards terrible destination. That may sound too strong to you, but I'll tell you, as you begin to read about the issue of gossip, criticism, and negative reports, I believe you will be firmly convicted of not only what you say, but what you listen to. I mean, how often? Our words ramble ca casually and carelessly without any thought as to the repercussions in another person's life. Comments such as, did you hear what Tom said about Carla? Or I'm really offended at Sally. Do you know what she did? They may seem innocuous at first, but what happens if we go unchecked? Other people hear those things and they begin to have their minds twisted and turned towards what we say. It may degrade an individual and create an atmosphere that provokes others towards feeling wronged and upset. The fallout from persons, person conversations leave a pattern of pain and relationship separation. Now I'll end with this. Like most of you, I've been on every side of the issue, making accusations, hearing accusations, and being the brunt of accusations. How can I be a light to the world when I'm speaking negatively? When I was a teacher, I wanted my students and colleagues to feel the support of my words not the sting of my words. And as a parent, I want my children to feel encouraged by my comments, not given license to have negative thoughts and make critical comments about others. Our careless ways of speaking cannot always be chalked up to, I didn't know better, or I was only kidding. My desire is to walk a path of integrity, purity, and commitment in my relationships and interactions. This book is about healing, freedom, caring, 
compassion and love. If we can control the words that we say with our tongue and the conversations are limited to more encouraging and positive things, we will become a strong encouragement and testimony to the power of life through our words. And that's the essence of the book. Well said. I know uh, people often say, talk about things and concepts, not other people. But when is it okay to talk about other people? Great question. And, and, I, and I will add, that is how the second book got written. Because I wrote this first book on what to do when words get ugly. And I had a lot of people saying, well, Mike, I understand I should not say things. But for me, that's like, I'll never talk. And so I, I began to say, say, well, it is okay. Like you said, it is okay to say things, but let's look at when it is okay. So here are a couple of guidelines that I'll give you. Number one is I think it's okay to share if your heart is to help educate someone into a situation, not to prove a point, not to make them believe what you believe, but simply to bring up another perspective and another side of things. I think it's first, it's a very, a very good to share those things. I think it's okay to bring up a topic. If you feel that you have certain information that personally impacts you. And I know that oftentimes I will say, you know, here's how I see it or from my perspective, or I might even say to another person, I know you may not agree with me, but this is how I see it. And I preface a lot of my comments with that as I bring up topics that I know are going to be a little bit, uh, you know, conflict oriented. So I will do that. A third area that I may use to make decisions as to whether I bring something up is, is it any of my business? How many times have I heard people say things? Oh, I've got an opinion. What's the old saying? Opinions are like belly buttons. Everybody's got one. And I've got an opinion, but who cares? I mean, why is my opinion so valuable? That's and great. so that's, that's an area to look at too, is, is it really any of your business? Oh, well, thank you, Michael. And that's all the time we have today. I want to thank you, Michael, for being my special guest. I want to thank our broadcast engineer, our floor manager, and Jay Fidel, our executive producer. A special mahalo to our underwriters. And thank you for joining us. Books, books, books. We'll be back in two weeks. Until then, read, write, and create your world. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.